Hartman program we are on with Tom Hartman. The primary topic of the day has been student debt relief and the sort of underlying student debt crisis and we've had the benefit of having Tom's thoughts on that and we can put that through and if you read Tom's uh, op-ed uh, you can put that, see that through a lens of not only kind of what evils are happening, but maybe through a positive lens of what he has called sort of the fourth turning, right? A, a new era in American politics, moving from a Milton Friedman driven kind of greed is good, big lie of the sum of the self interest will magically yield the public interest to something different than that. We can see this little thing that happened. And it's, to be clear, 10,000 times millions and millions of people. It's not just a tiny thing, but it's a step towards what might be a more perfect union. Tom, anything about the era that you say, that, and I think many people hope, is the era we're approaching that is surprising you? Maybe it's just how long it's taken to have a reawakening of kind of people-driven American politics. But anything else that's surprised you about what's been happening in the trans potential transformation in our politics? Um, it's, it's a tough one. I, I, I've, I've written about this, in fact, um, in, in one of my hidden history books, I'm trying to remember, I think it's the one on oligarchy, about, um, you know, there's the, these 80-year cycles in American history that Strauss and Howe identified in the fourth turning in generations. Um, but there's also within those 80-year cycles, there's 40-year uh, cycles. And it seems that it takes about two generations. You know, the 40-year the cycle begins with everybody saying, oh, hey, a, a brilliant new idea, you know, Reaganomics. Uh, let's try this. It'll, it'll, it'll prosper the middle class. It'll help everybody. It's going to, you know, it's going to lift all boats. It's going to, you know, help the environment or help, help the economy. And then we try, the, try it out. And it takes 20, 30 years before it becomes obvious that, you know, parts of it work, parts of it don't. But then in the last decade or so of that 40-year uh, tranche, that 40-year slice, that's when the people who are the advocates of the ideas push them so far to the extreme, so far to the wall, that society as a whole starts to pull back and say, wait a minute, that's too, you've gone too far. And that, you know, that, that happened, I think, on the on the left. You had, you know, the progressive movement that came out of, out of uh, FDR's New Deal. Um, right up until the 60s, and then there was a pushback in the 70s that led to the Reagan Revolution, and that pushback was against the rapid change. I don't think it was so much a pushback against the ideas of change that were happening in the 70s, but, you know, in, 19, in 1972, uh, birth control was legalized for married couples. In, uh, in uh, I'm sorry, there was 65 with Griswold. There was 72 birth control was legalized for unmarried couples. In 73, uh, abortion was legalized. You had the women's movement growing in strength. You had the, uh, the, the uh, civil rights movement for African Americans. And it, it was, you know, it, and, and the anti-war movement was huge. And all of those things kind of, you know, the, 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 the pushback to those things created the ground for Reaganism. Well, similarly, Reaganism went through a period of 20, 30 years where they were basically able to kind of BS us. And there were some parts of it that were not unreasonable. But, you know, this massive deficit spending, the, the whole two, two Santa Claus uh, theory that yeah. uh, Jude Wininsky pitched, massive deficit spending during Republican presidencies in order to produce economic good times, causing people to think that it was Republican economics that was producing the good times, when in fact, fact it was just pure stimulus. You know, it's 20, $22 trillion worth of, worth of stimulus. And, and uh, so, you know, I think people have finally figured out that, that you know, that doesn't work anymore. And, uh, and, and now you've got the people on the right have hit that extreme of, you know, uh, trying to lock down women and everything else. And, and so now we're pushing back against the, quote, excesses of the right. And by we, you know, I'm talking about society as a whole. Obviously, a society as a whole is much more conservative than I am, far less conservative than Ronald Reagan was. And so, you know, I, that's what I'm seeing happening. And I think it was fairly predictable. So I want to do a hard pivot, which is going to be synchronously ironic, given the topic that uh, originally we want to talk about, which is just any quick take before we go to the break. Then I want to get back to people's calls. We've been waiting really, really patiently. Uh, first of all, you're coming back on Monday. Yeah. And then yes. we, we don't want to keep you on your sitting down and uncomfortable position for, for too much longer. But. But any take now, any any plug you want to give for any of your ADHD books or any 
any way, if you had one thing that people ought to be thinking about to better understand ADHD, is it's now again more in the public conversation. What's what's the to you sort of the most important takeaway to help frame people's understanding? In 1996, I wrote a book which is now still in print. It's, uh, in its current title is ADHD: Hunter in a Farmer's World and in which I proposed that um, uh, in, for the vast majority of people, probably 80, 90 percent of people who were diagnosed with ADHD, clearly there are some people on the edges of that spectrum that are completely dysfunctional. But for the vast majority of people who were being dis diagnosed, that ADHD was not a character flaw and it was not a medical crisis or a, a disorder, that it was simply a, a difference and a difference that survived in the human genome of all races and all people from all over the planet throughout the history of the human race because it conferred an evolutionary advantage to us. And that that advantage vanishes when you put those ADHD people in a classroom um, or in a factory or in an agricultural setting where they've got to practice patience and, and, uh, and quell their curiosity and uh, stop their you know, sensation-seeking behavior but for people who are detectives and explorers of the world and inventors, I mean, Thomas Edison was the prototype of ADHD. Um, for those people, ADHD has changed the world in a very positive way. And so, you know, I've written now, I think five or six books on the topic. That, that first book I still think is the one that people should start with, uh, ADHD Hunter in a Farmer's World. Well, you're a master of the timing of the show. I understand why. And thank you for doing your part in Change the World. Thank you so much for being with us today. Excited to have you back on Monday. I know the listeners are. And thanks so much for spending some time, man. Hope you're, hope you're well. Hope the back heals up well. And, and say hi to your spouse.